today's uh, presentation for myself is on an observational level. It's like from the trenches. Um, we have science with ADAO, but the information I'm going to present today is, is some research from um, different studies, but a lot of observational information, which for um, some of the other folks, they, they don't see what we see at ADAO. So it's a collection of, of stories and anecdotal evidence as well as some research. This is the question, who's the asbestos victim? Now after Dr. Lemon's excellent presentation, Dr. Miller's, you've heard from Im impressive speakers, who's the victim? And a picture is worth a thousand words. We know that asbestos is responsible for a catastrophic public health crisis and as we uh, also saw from Dr. Orris, it's, uh, asbestos is, accounts for 50% of occupational cancer. That's huge. The stress and trauma is life altering for those who've been exposed to asbestos. You've heard from John and his family. They wait for these diseases to possibly present and they think, will I, won't I, if I do, what will happen? It's, uh, the trauma from knowing that you're exposed is huge. I want you to think for a second, okay, it could be me. I could have walked past that building that was demolished. Maybe there was natural occurring asbestos I wasn't even aware of, and how about the crayons I played with? On a slide, I don't want to do an injustice to meet the victims, but I want you to see some numbers here and the diseases they have. So stay with me. The photographs you just saw of six people are the people on this slide who've been gracious enough to share their story. What you're gonna quickly notice is you're not seeing the 73-year-old veteran anymore. You're seeing young people, and quite frankly, they have non-occupational exposure. These are the three that are gone but not for forgotten. Sparky, Adam, and Eve, they all lost their battles with this, present, with this preventable asbestos-caused disease. Adam was only 33, an only child. His parents had become incredible advocates. So this is what we're coming out of this. We no longer fade to black when someone dies in our family. This slide is important, and I thank Jason Addy for this in, in, in the UK. It shows graphically the history and the devastation from asbestos. The ILO quotes 100,000 workers lose their life every year. The WHO quotes possibly 90,000. Well, as Dr. Orris mentioned, we know these ADAO estimates, these uh, uh, numbers are grossly inadequate because the numbers and studies normally tally up disease from people with occupational exposure. So we, from what we've collected, think that there's a 40% higher rate of disease than what's reported. In a quick glance, we look at the history of disease. We know we've, we, st we reduced our usage as of the late 70s, have, do not have a ban. Disease take a long time to present. Importantly, mesothelioma, just, they just began, began recording that, coding it properly so you can record disease and death. So if you think about it, we've only had maybe 10 years of good data, so how on earth can we forecast future disease? We can't. This is, this is from the victim's perspective, so I don't want to offend any of the doctors. I, so that's my apologies. Evolution of disease. If you know you were exposed, you've got one set of cards. For those people who have, don't even realize it, there's another. In a nutshell, there's, th there's three stages here. And I, it's, I have 10 minutes to deliver this message. There's a trauma component from people that are exposed. There's a trauma component from those who get diagnosed. It affects the entire family. We've had some patient from diagnosis to death, it only takes two days. Some people have the good fortune and early diagnosis to still be living a good quality of life 14 years later. Every patient is different. Early diagnosis improves treatment options, very important. Quite quickly, two kinds of exposure from our organization. We just look at occupational and non-occupational. Dr. Lemon went through all of these different areas of occupational exposure. What we're finding is that there's a lot of home exposure. Asbestos abatement's not done properly. 
We have codes that aren't enforced. We have people calling us up saying, how do I know my, uh, my employer's asking me to take out these asbestos tiles? Are they contaminated? Aren't they? There's a lot of misinformation and confusion. We do know that there's no safe level of, of, of asbestos exposure. We know that there's gonna be disease for decades to come. And we also know from a couple of slides that there are 30 million homes that are homes, office buildings, schools that are contaminated with asbestos. So even with a ban upside, we still have decades of disease to plan for. Most importantly, we wanna talk about non-occupational exposure because that's really where you don't see the studies focused. So you, you, we know we have consumer products take home. The 9-11 incident, there are first responders, and because they have occupational exposure, Dr. Levin's um, Mount Sinai and other organizations up there are doing some great work. But there's a, there's a residence component. There are kids down at school. So although we're five years out, we haven't even seen the catastrophic effect of 9-11 from a non-occupational exposure. We know we need disease registries, effective outreach, and we need to implement a surveillance program. We think these will be very cost effective in the long run. We talk about detection. For the victims, that's huge. Many of us go undiagnosed for nine to 12 months. What does that mean? You've just spent a year waiting to be diagnosed. Your treatment options are reduced. And it's no fault of the doctors, but the long latency period um, the la long latency period basically complicates the issue because um, the victim doesn't remember that they where they worked, what's occupational exposure. So we, ADAO, would really like to see more of comprehensive occupational environmental histories taken when the when the patient's examined. We know many of you doctors do. We're not we're not preaching to you. It's it's the other the other area. Two kinds of diseases for the patients. We look at malignant and non-malignant. The slides are self-explanatory. Two doctors will follow me to address both of those. Data gaps, very large problem. Because of the difficulty of diagnosing and underreporting and miscoding of death certificates, we don't have our arms around the true catastrophic effect of this disease. On a quick personal note, my husband, Alan, when he did pass away, to have his death recorded properly, I had to meet with the coroner 20 minutes before his funeral to substantiate occupational exposure, exposure to have his death certificate quoted properly, or they were not going to allow me to bury my husband. This slide is from Dr. Jim Brofried's Sarnia. And in a quick read, you can see that about 65% of the patients suffer from cancer and the other 35 from, non, from the plural diseases like asbestosis. The 1990 victim, yes, he was about a 63-year-old veteran, and five of the states up until 1999 had most of the, the um, patients. But our new patient profile is a woman who's 51. She has children, and she has either unknown or take-home exposure. 51, she's a mother. So these are our observations that we know that an earlier diagnosis improves treatment options. Patients are actually living longer, and they're living longer to, to sometimes develop other cancers. Um, Les Graham said it was very public. He suffered from asbestosis for 11 years. Uh, a couple weeks before he actually passed away, he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. It's good and bad. Our patients are living longer. The downside is they, the, these diseases are not curable. We treat them, we don't cure them. Younger people are being diagnosed, why? Shortened latency period, maybe they're more in tune to their body because when you can't breathe and your chest hurts, you go to your doctor. When you're older, you might just think you have a respiratory infection or you just can't get around like you're used to. As a quick number, it saves lives and money to prevent disease, to ban the dust. An average mesothelioma's patient medical expenses can exceed a million dollars. We've had a great session so far. This next session is important to me because I think the trauma side is not addressed effectively. We're gonna have two doctors talk about malignant and non-malignant disease. We have an, the incredible team from Libby here that's gonna address trauma. Mary Hesdorfer from Columbia is gonna talk about coping with cancer. And a very dear friend, Alan's angel, and she's a member of our ADA board, Dr. Freddie Siegel Gadan, is gonna talk about those issues that nobody else wants to talk about, their end of life. Doesn't mean end of living, 
but it's end of life in thinking and having a plan. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Harbert. Thank you. Thank you.